If you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, Joshua chapter number 10. Kill, if you could turn the pulpit mic off. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Y'all good with that? We have been in the spring, we have been in a sermon series called God Pleasers. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must live lives of faith. Last week I talked about abstract faith, that which is... Um, uh, you don't have the tangible evidence of it, but it, you believe it, and because you speak it and because you're out there, God joins you in that, and that's a, an absolutely wonderful thought. Today, um, I'm going to talk about audacious faith. Now, Bradley, I didn't say bodacious. I, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> audacious faith. There's sometimes we need to, we have a God that's so big, so large, so wonderful, so kind. And sometimes we just think he is so small. Sometimes we think that he is as big as us, but no bigger. That he's not bigger than our issues of life. Sometimes people, when they are going through a physical ailment, they may hope that God is bigger. But whether you... Uh, see yourself big or whether you see God as being big, it doesn't change who he is. And it doesn't change how powerful he is. He can do all. He holds all. He maintains all. He is sovereign. He is God over all. But there is a direct relationship between God and his economy and what he will do by what we believe. And we see those who have great faith, and God works mighty works through them. And I don't know when the Lord's coming, but when he does come, I want him to find me serving him. And I want him to see in me that I believe that he is God and that he is great and, and that his hand is good and that he is actively a part, that I am expecting him to do great and mighty things. That I am expecting God to be real, not just something on Sunday, but God that will fit every day of the week. God will fit every circumstance. And that there's nothing too big that we can't pray about. And there's nothing too small that he doesn't care about that we can't pray about. And it comes from a life overflowed with him. And that's what I want to talk about today in Joshua chapter Number 10, if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word, we're going to begin in verse number 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon chased them along the road that goes from Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekiah and Makeda. And it came, and it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord, now God's getting involved in this, the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekiah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, listen to this prayer, Son, stand still over Gibeon, moon in the valley of Aegilon. So the, Lord, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Yeshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down, down for about a whole day. Now there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man 
for the Lord fought for Israel. And the same Lord will fight for you. And the same Lord is the Lord here at New Holland. Let's pray. Lord, you, there is no doubt that you are Lord and you are great and you are all-powerful and all-knowing in every place. We know that. You're the God of heaven. Lord, you're also the God of earth. And you knew us. You formed us. You know the plans that you have for us. And God, I, I'm grateful that you're not only the God of the plans, but you're the God of being with us in those plans. You're the God that fulfills plans. I am so very grateful that there is no prayer that's bigger than you. I am so grateful that there are no circumstances in life that take you by surprise. I am so glad that, Lord, you're not afraid of circumstances. And, Lord, that you are, are, are there ready to fight on our behalf in our lives. In the darkness, you are a light. Lord, that, that, that you would be actively involved with us. And I pray, oh God, that we would be actively involved with you. Lord, may we join the work that you're doing. And be grateful for the calling that you've placed in our lives. Lord, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that we, we would see you. That we would have a glimpse and an understanding of how great you are, our God. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you. Lord, help me be so small so that you can be big. I pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Joshua was somewhere between 35 and 40 years old when Moses showed up in Egypt. Think about this. Joshua was born in slavery. All he had ever known was slavery. Someone else telling him what he would do, when he would do it, how he would do it. He had no life of his own. It was a life of drudgery. I don't know the specific thing that he was called to do. The children of Israel were very much about building, and they would build the things and the, the big uh, places down in Egypt. And, and the Bible tells us that God heard the prayers of Israel in Egypt because of the oppression of the slavery. And God sent that man named Moses. And Joshua got to see a life of, of heartache and pain. But he also saw a God that, that he had heard the stories of. Until this time... The stories of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those were, were written down by Moses later on. But the stories of Genesis had been passed down in the homes, uh, around the, in the villages, among the people. He knew the stories of God Almighty. But all he had experienced was slavery and bondage and brokenness and heartache and pain. In the United States, we have churches. We live in the Bible Belt, but we have churches all across the United States. Some absolutely magnificent buildings, stained glass, manicured yards, air-conditioned, paved parking lots, steeples on top that you can see for miles. And people have heard the stories, and they know that there's a God. We've, they, they, they've, they've been told the stories and maybe they've seen it on TV or maybe they've heard a song on the radio or maybe they know someone. Maybe they had a teacher in school that didn't care what the school board said. They would still pray over their kids. But they had heard the stories, but when they saw the, the evidence of, the, of life, they still were brokenhearted, disillusioned, dismayed wondered in fear if there is a God then why doesn't he do something if there is a God then why is there so much pain why is there so much heartache understand 
God didn't create it that way, and God will make sure that it doesn't end that way. But he allowed us the privilege of living in this day and in this time, and it is a privilege. And it's a privilege to be able to hear the Word of God, to have the Word of God, to, to, to let it become part of our life. It, it's a privilege to be able to see through the things of life and, and to see past this world and see God high and lifted up on the throne in heaven and to know that God loves me. I love Vacation Bible School. I will always love Vacation Bible School, and, and I pray that we will be actively involved in what God has his hand on as pouring after these little children the stories of a great big God who loves them and died for them and rose again for them. And he's the God who can save. Joshua lived a life, but then all of a sudden, God shows up and he says, I love you with an everlasting love. God shows up and says, you don't have to live here anymore. And you know the story how he, by, by the showing of what wasn't a big thing to, to God, but, but it seemed like a miracle to the people that, that God would intervene in the everyday to show himself strong. And the one who said that you cannot leave said you have to leave. Wow. And, and God had a, a plan for their path that they would go. It wasn't an easy path, though, but it had a purpose behind it. And they found themselves at the Red Sea with mountains on this side and mountains on this back side. And that mad, oh so mad Egyptian army coming after them. Now what would God do? Now he's delivered his people and put them in such a place. But it wasn't a big thing for God. And Moses lifted out his staff. And the hand of God parted the waters and the winds blew and they got to walk through the Red Sea on a dusty road. And after they got to the other side, God closed the sea. Oh, what a God. They saw the mountain that Moses went up on, a mountain on fire, smoke. And everyone, it, 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 it's not like a volcano. It was the presence of Almighty God. And you never mistake it when it's God. You know that it's God. And the earth quaked. But yet they didn't know what that meant for them. So while God was on the mountain, they were having a little party down at the bottom. But Joshua went halfway. Now he sees something. Listen to me now. His heart is turned and he wants that in his life. He has known bondage. He has had question marks. But now he sees that God is the answer and he wants to be close. And God shows himself strong in the children of Israel. Go to the place that had been promised. To Abraham it had been promised. It had been over 400 years and now they're there. And Moses sent in the 12 spies. And they all came back and said, Man, that's, this place is great. It's wonderful. It's big. It's huge. It's, they, they carried clusters of grapes. They had to put them on a pole between two people that were so bountiful. Man, Kroger's would like to sell that. Amen? And yet, of the 12 spies, 10 of them said, beautiful, but there's no way we can do it. Listen, church, all they could see was what they could do. They couldn't see beyond themselves. But you'll never see God see God till you get beyond yourself. Because when you get beyond yourself, that's where you find the beginning of the eternal. But there were two. Caleb and Joshua said everything that they've said is correct, except we know that there's a God and we know that he's promised. And we don't know what it means, but we know God will show himself strong. What would it be like today if we had some modern-day Joshua's and Caleb's who were not saying that the problems of life are not there, not saying that the, the hardships and the pains and the bondage of every day is, is not real, but seeing a God that's bigger and alive and vibrant and, and active in those circumstances. 
Well, because of their unbelief, 40 years of dying in the wilderness. I call it the longest funeral service in the history of the world. Moses does another funeral. Moses does another funeral. What are we going to do today? We're going to go to funeral. That's what we always do. 40 years of funerals out in the wilderness. But now, that generation of unbelief has gone. Those that were 20 and under have grown. That tells me that there are some that still remember the bondage in Egypt. They may have been young, but they still saw what God had done. And now they're going to walk through with a vigor. They're going to trust God. But listen to me. God still wanted them to walk it out. They still had to do what God told them to do at Jericho. And because they didn't do it at Ai, this little inept group chased them off like dogs until they got sin out of their life and got straightened back out. Then Ai falls. Then this group called Gibeon. They, they look at this and say, oh my goodness, we got to do something about this. So they dressed up as poor, ragged people, and, and they came, and they tricked Joshua. God told them, do not make a covenant with them, but he did anyway because he felt sorry for them. He trusted in what his human heart would lead rather than the word of God. Be very careful at the pulling of the heartstrings that may sound reasonable to you, but is against the word of God. God doesn't say, believe all the parts that make sense. He says, believe all of his word. God will show himself real. Well, then all of a sudden, Joshua finds out they're lying. Matter of fact, five other kings see that Gibeon has made this treaty, and, and they're scared of Israel, but now they say, Gibeon, it's a mighty city too. We've got to come together together. And, and as we come together, we will, we will come against these people and we'll defeat them together. So they come and, and they're going against them. And Gibeon's are like, oh, no, hey, we don't like this. So they call unto Joshua. And they said, hey, we made this covenant with you. Now, it's a good thing Joshua was a man of God because Brian would have said, what well, it serves you right. But that's not how it works. You give your word, you keep your word. So he did. Stonewall Jackson knew this story. There was a particular time that Confederate general said, yes, we will do exactly that. And they did a forced march all night long. As soon as day broke, they attacked. As soon as they went to attack, they began to win. And the children of Israel are romping them. And they're running for their life. And God's like, hey, Joshua, good job. Let me get involved in this too. And he starts sending down hailstones from heaven and killing them off. Matter of fact, the Bible says more died from the hailstones than from the sword of Israel. But God had come and had told him, do not be afraid. Look what it says here. Uh, do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Isn't it funny when you go into it, though you haven't walked out, the promise is already there. It's past tense. The victory is already there. Oh, can I just pause and say every day we need to wake up and say victory in Jesus. Because we go forward from victory, not to victory. God's already delivered them into your hand. Go, do not fear them. No man shall stand before you. So they're going forth and they're killing everybody and, and all these five kings are falling. Listen to me now. And it's getting to the end of the day. And what God promised had not been fulfilled yet. What do you do? And out of the heart of Joshua came this audacious prayer. Son, stand. Still, I'm going to just sit here and marinate that for just a second. He looks it to the God of heaven who holds the sun and said, Lord, make it stop. There's more work to be done. I love listening to the foolishness of liberals. Oh, 
this is actually an allegory. It's a, it's a story. It tells us how God just can take time and, and, and make time stand still. Don't be so stupid. Now, I understand that the Bible tells us in Peter, uh, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I believe that. He's a God of eternity. He's not encapsulated by time. The time is this little thing called, it's, it's like a parenthesis, and we're living within the parentheses, but he's the God that's bigger than that. But the God who can control the whole parentheses, if he wants to make it stop, he can. It's not that big a deal for him. And his soldier who is being obedient, who is trying to fulfill the word that he put him to do. Listen, faith is acting on the word of God. And to fulfill the word of God, if you want the power of God to be on it, just ask him to do. I think God will back up his word. You mean God would even make the, the sun stop in the sky? I believe this book from Genesis to maps, all the way in between. If he so chooses. Matter of fact, I read the, the verse to you from Chronicles last week. The Lord is looking over the earth to and fro, looking for someone who will be faithful. God's not upset by this. I believe God in heaven said, Amen. Great faith, audacious faith is what I would say. Hey, stop that thing. Now, I'm amazed when we look at the stars in glory. I'm amazed at how the moon controls the tides. I'm amazed at how I can breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide and those trees and plants, they take in the carbon dioxide and they bring out oxygen. Who can make that stuff up? We know it's true. Too much of one, we'd be in trouble. Too, li too much of the other, we'd be in trouble. But God puts it perfectly in balance. And we just take it for granted every day. Oh, what a God we have. The God who brings order in life. The God who can take this thing called gravity and, my, doesn't it work? But Mark sang about it. Mark spoke about it. And one day, the law of gravity will be, uh, it will be broken again. We saw it when Jesus lifted his hands up to heaven and ascended back to glory. And the Bible says he's coming back and he'll call us home. And we'll go to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. I mean, God can break the laws of this world anytime. Listen to me now. He so chooses. But let me just share with you quick. It's not so much. If, you, if you're going to get hung up on God stopping the sun in the, in the sky, you just don't know the same God I know. But don't get, don't get hung up on that. What I want to know, want you to notice is the heart of the man who prayed it. Because he had walked with God from the time of slavery in Egypt. And he had seen God strong. And he saw God to be a loving, kind God who cared about the issues of his life to the point that he could just, from a heart of belief, from a heart of belief, he could just shout out and say, Son, stand still and expect and believe and know that God would do that. Jesus had a word. Let's bring this to the New Testament, Matthew 17, 20. The, Jesus had been up on the mountain of transfiguration, and he come down and found a fight going on. The Pharisees are there, and they're fighting with his disciples. And there's this man who had this child who had a demon in it, and, and they couldn't do anything about it. Pharisees couldn't do anything about it. Jesus' disciples couldn't do anything about it. And, and long story short, Jesus healed the child. And, and, and the child goes home with his father, and everything's good. Amen. But the disciples came and said, Lord, why could we not do it? Jesus, he wasn't much to beat around the bush. He said in Matthew 17, verse 20, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, that's a very, very small seed. If you've got the smallest of faiths, if you have a faith that is real, like a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will, be, it will move. For nothing will be impossible to God. Now, I'm not talking about earth moving. I'm not talking about great big bulldozers. 
though God can be whatever he so chose. He says you can take any mountain and say, be moved from here and it will be moved. Can I just tell you, I don't care what the obstacle in your life is. Come on, church. I don't care how big. I don't care how, how immovable our God can move it. He goes on to say it in, in, uh, again in Matthew 21. He says uh, Jesus was going to Jerusalem and, and uh, he found, this is humorous, he finds a fig tree that has all the flowers on it. It should be, have fruit on it. But he goes to it and he finds the tree's a hypocrite because it has all the looks of fruit, but it has no fruit on it. And Jesus curses it. That's a sermon for another day. So the next day when they were coming through, the disciples looked over and they saw the fig tree and, and they saw that it had withered. One day, it, gone, it had gone from all the leaves to being absolutely just withered. And Jesus said, Surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what, you, what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And then this verse, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Faith is born in our hearts. But doubts arise in our hearts as well. We'll say, we believe, but, but, but. There's this disappointment in my life. There's this hurt. There's this injustice that's happened. There's this evil in the world that I don't understand. There, I prayed and God seemed quiet. God's hand hadn't been seen. There's a wound. Church, listen to me. There's a wound that comes up in our heart because we believe. We trusted, but maybe it didn't happen just the way. And there was a wound that was there, a wound of unbelief, a wound of doubt. I don't know how many people are here today, but I'll tell you that wound has happened in every life. There's nobody that hasn't had to face tough decisions, disillusionment, wonder, you prayed for someone not to be taken, but God took them anyway. You prayed for that thing to be removed, but God didn't take it away. You had this person who, this ungodly person that was in your life, and you said, Lord, change them. God didn't change them. It happens in families, and the wound is there. Sometimes things happen, but sometimes we're the victim. Are y'all good with that? You didn't want it, but it happened anyway. And your heart is broken. And you want to yell out to God. I, I love the honesty in the word because many times it comes and, and talks about how people were, were mad at God because God wasn't doing things the way they wanted it done. They had their life scoped out and God, let, God didn't let it happen. And evil occurs. And there's a wound, just like a cut, that happened in their life. And if the wound doesn't heal, it remains. There are wounds that happen in grammar school that people are still living the effects of today. I've done a lot of marriage counseling in my life. And I cannot tell you how many times there would be a phrase that one spouse would say to the other spouse that was never forgotten. And it always came back up. And they wondered if that person loved them, but yet there was a wound that was there. There's a wall that's just too big. There's a mountain that's too big. But let me remind you that wounds heal from the inside out. 
But what we want to do is we want to put a Band-Aid on it. And we want, what we want is we want God to affect the outside. We want God to affect the circumstance. But there's a God who is the God who heals. But he heals from the inside out. And faith occurs from the inside out. Faith may be, though there is a, a mountain in front of you, yet on the inside you know and you believe and you trust, and unwaveringly you're going to call upon him and ask him to do what only he can do. I am so blessed by the life of Job. The man who had it all and lost it all except the well, I'm not going to give the adjective in front of that wife. The one who said, curse God and die. What an encourager she was. I call her the wicked witch of Job's life. And yet, listen to these words of Job. He said, though he will slay me, yet will I praise him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you going to serve God only if he's good in your eyes? Or are you going to serve God because he's good no matter what? Are you going to face a difficulty and a hardship? And, and, and are you going to say, well, I, I, I wish, but nothing really I can do. Or are you going to grab hold of a great big God? A great big God who cares. And you're going to, you're going to put it before him and say, God, I believe and I trust Turn loose to God. Can you pray a sun stand still audacious prayer in your life? Are you going to trust God to be exceedingly abundantly above? You think God can do the answers? When you can't see his hand, you still trust his heart? What do we do? This is my phrase. I'm, I'm, I'm praying this prayer every day. Church, listen to your pastor. My prayer is, Lord, I want your will, your way, for your glory. Whatever is your will. And we'll do it exactly the way you said. For your glory. And I'm trusting God to be big. You see, I'm not so delusional to think that I can do great things. As a matter of fact, in my quiet time this morning, I was not preparing for this message. I was just in my quiet time. I read Zechariah 1, 2, and 3. Where Zechariah was reminded, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit. We don't need a stronger workforce. We need a a people that are weak enough to see God strong enough. If I started throwing out things to you, I, I understand a couple Wednesday nights ago, uh, I went to hang out with Mark and the youth, got to hear him speak. I understand Bradley was in here and he started challenging the people. How many of y'all were here that night? Raise your hand. More of y'all, y'all are all invited to Wednesday night just so that you know. Amen. And they started saying, well, where do you want to see the church in a year? Where do you want to see the church in three years? Where do you want to see the church in five years? What do you think the offering should be? I think Ricky got excited. I said that to say this. It was good to hear that on a Wednesday night church service. I wonder actually how many of them believed it when they left. You know what I'm saying? We, when we're here and we're talking about a great big God, do we believe that he can do all, all things? Do you believe he could, we could actually pray and God would stop the sun in the heaven? Joshua did. Joshua did. You see, sometimes I believe God is going to allow circumstances to come that are going to knock us down to our knees. And God doesn't see it as a bad thing. 
He sees it as a good thing because he's going to show himself strong. And Kai, one of my favorite preachers, used to say, a miracle a day or keep Satan away. Well, can I just say that I just need to begin my walk again? I need to make sure that my prayer life is fresh again. I need to come back to the Word of God and I need to read every word of it and I need to say, Lord, let your Word come alive again. And I need to see the stories that are there and I need to look at my life and I say, God, answer. And Lord, if the answer is not my way, if as long as it is your way, blessed be the name of the Lord. And God, I'm going to trust you to do those things that I cannot do. I can't save souls, but he can. I can't encourage hearts, but he can. I can't mend what this world has broken, but he can. Humpty Dumpty was pushed. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him together again. But God can. Mary and Martha wanted Jesus to come because their brother Lazarus was sick. But, but Jesus delayed because he wasn't interested in another healing. This time he was interested in a resurrection. You may be praying for a healing when God is looking for a resurrection. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me just ask, which prayer was answered? Both. It just got a lot more extreme than what they thought. The prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there's any way, he didn't want to have to go through the difficulty of life. Did you hear me? Jesus didn't like it either. He didn't want to have to walk out that path. Lord, if there's any other way, this cup can pass from me. But praise God, his faith, nevertheless, not my will. Thy will be done. Your will, your way, for your glory. I think it took greater faith to walk out Calvary's road and, and to give his life a ransom and to come back so that we could have eternal life. Then it would have been for him to say, just take me back to heaven now. It took greater faith. You may be praying for God to take something away. And you may be taking away the exact thing that God put in your life for your blessing. Paul said three times he prayed that that thorn in the flesh would be removed. But God didn't take it away. But Paul had the faith to praise God all the way to the end. He didn't get mad at God. He didn't quit. He kept going. Though he may slay me, yet will I serve him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. New Holland, where are you today? Where's your prayers? What's your expectations? God help us. God help us. What is it you want to see God do that only he can do? What is it that God wants to see in your life that only you can do with his help? Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Oh, Lord, you see us where we are. You know our need. God, we know our need. There are many who testify today that they know that you're the God of that need. Yet they're still wounded, battling and hurt. God, would you just uh, raise up that audacious faith in their life? God, would you just be close with them in that wound? Would they allow you? I pray that they would allow you to heal that wound. Oh, Lord, we go through things in life when we get knocked down, but I pray that we not stay down. 
but we trust you for a resurrection. Resurrection life by your spirit. Send the mighty hand of God to do what only you can do. We are so not bold, we are not so bold and proud and Lord uh, hindered by thinking that we can do all for you. Lord, we're busted without you. We're bankrupt without you. Oh, I pray for audacious faith in the pew today. Oh, Lord, give us the, the 2020 vision of seeing you. Great and mighty and strong. Heal, oh, Lord. Set us free. Lord, let us hear your voice and mightily run after you. Lord, I want to thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do among your people. Begin right now. Lord, if there's someone in this building that does not know you as Savior and Lord, may they, Lord, give up on everything else and come and ask you to do for them what only you can do. Change a life, oh God, as only you can. And for those that are Christians that are walking, Lord, that guilty distance, they're not being faithful, begin it again today. Lord, may we not see the impossibilities. Lord, may we just see you as you can do all things. And you'll even do it with us. Father, bless this invitation. In your name I pray. Amen.